27th District moves that we stand adjourned, sign it out. All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. no. We stand adjourned, sign it out. This house is now adjourned, sign it out. Good evening, everyone. I'm Gerald Bryant. And I'm in Wandy Lawson. Before we begin our legislative coverage, this breaking news story, the state capitol has been evacuated. Capitol Police tell our reporters there has been a bomb threat. If we learn any more about that during our broadcast, we'll bring that news to you. That, of course, is a live picture of the state capitol from one of our cameras. Well, it was two minutes to midnight when the 2005 session of the Georgia General Assembly adjourned sine die last night. The House and Senate met their goal of finishing legislative business on the 39th day, although not as early as they had originally planned. Lawmakers talked about adjourning by early evening, but it took several extra hours to agree on a conference committee report on ethics reform legislation. However, parts of the committee compromise were different from Governor Perdue's original draft. David Zelsky joins us with more on House Bill 48. David. Well, Gerald, rumors, rumors filled the halls yesterday that House Bill 48 was not going to pass, at least not last night. But the conferees eventually found a compromise just before the clock struck midnight. First there was the 11 o'clock meeting. Plenty of lobbyists and media personnel, but no conferees, until Senator Don Balfour arrived. The biggest issue is probably a conflict of interest provision that uh, the Senate would like to put in. There's also, um, we came up with a way of putting uh, uh, a committee together to look at things, both Republicans and Democrats in the House and Senate. Then around 1 o'clock, the other two Senate conferees arrived, and Senate Ethics Committee Chair Renee Unterman discussed the status of ethics reform. We have been trying to find the House members to see if they would come up and meet with us. And unfortunately, we do not have a negotiating team here. Then around 1.15, the governor's House floor leader, Rich Golick, who sponsors House Bill 48, came to the table. But the conference committee was still two House members short of an official meeting. Representative Golick remained optimistic. I think both bodies want to get out a bill. I think there are certain fundamental disagreements they have, and the question is, will both bodies have the will to separate themselves from those disagreements, concentrate on the positive, and, um, and get the best bill we can out of the process? It didn't happen as quickly as planned, but a little after 11 p.m., an agreement was reached, and Speaker Richardson himself presented the bill to the House chamber. Any member of this caucus wishes to impose higher obligations upon yourself, as I know some of our members do on both sides of this aisle, you may. You can impose your own candidate-candidate ban. You cannot accept campaign contributions. You cannot accept a dinner. And you cannot accept this water that I'm sure came from someone. I didn't pay for it. Someone provided it to me. But you can refuse to drink it, just as you could refuse to come up to a public water fountain and drink it as well. And that's a matter each and every member will have to determine for themselves. Now another ethics reform bill passed earlier in the day, House Bill 665, which offers whistleblower protections but was actually separate from House Bill 48, just as a precaution in case 48 didn't pass. Now both ethics reform bills are back where they originated on the governor's desk. I'm David Zelsky for Lawmakers. All right, thanks so much, David. Well, as we reported earlier, the 2005 session of the Georgia General Assembly wrapped up shortly before midnight last night. But before the senators and representatives left the Capitol, we caught up with some lawmakers to see how they thought the session went. I'm kind of overwhelmed right now. I was humbled by the opportunity given to me, and I'm still humbled by it. But, uh, you know, uh, we, we hadn't had a, the Republicans hadn't governed in Georgia since 1870, and we came in and we did a job. and. I think whenever you look at what we did, you'll see we passed the most comprehensive and sweeping package of legislation to help Georgians that's ever been done. Well, I thought it was very efficient. Uh, we did the people's business. We did it in 39 days. Like we promised, we created a lot of good things for the people of Georgia. We repealed a lot of bad law. We did, we did a lot of things for the, um, the actual family. We did things that we're, we're going to be, all be proud of. We've got a strong ethics legislation. We've got strong economic development legislation. And the people of Georgia are going to be very pleased with what we accomplished. Well, I'm glad to have it over. It's been a very difficult session, a um, lot of contention. Uh, uh, after serving 31 years, uh, uh, you still have that uh, your ups and downs and uh, the highlights. And uh, tonight we were able to... Uh, come to grips with uh, with an ethics package. Uh, it's, it's not as strong as a lot of us would want it to have been. 
but uh, such as the compromise and such as the art of politics under the Gold Dome. That, th this, this session was really marked, I think, by um, kind of an uncritical ladling out of uh, the uh, privileges to the business community. Uh, huge, huge uh, tax cuts for business. Well, it's like um, uh, every session. There were some high points and some low points. I was disappointed that we didn't really get a strong ethics bill. I was a little bit disappointed that we really didn't do what we needed to do on education. Uh, but, but there were some, some good things, uh, some things uh, I'm proud of. Uh, we worked very hard on laws to uh, fight against uh, cyber predators, which um, is something that I think will have a real effect on making children safe in Georgia. I think it was very, very positive. I think we accomplished a tremendous amount. Uh, we have created ethics. We have a fine budget. Uh, we have addressed child support. We have addressed education. We have addressed the, the issues that were the concerns in the state of Georgia, and we've done a fantastic job of, of addressing those issues. This year's session ran only 39 legislative days. In recent years, the General Assembly has adjourned sine die on the 40th legislative day. Governor Sonny Perdue gives this legislative session high marks. I spoke with the governor today and began by asking him if he was pleased with the ethics bill that passed late last night. Absolutely. We've got a great ethics bill, uh, the strongest in Georgia's history. I think it will give the public better disclosure. It will give opportunity for citizens to, uh, to uh, bring forth complaints to a body that will uh, address those. We have a whistleblower act. Uh, we've got uh, anti-nepotism, uh, stopping revolving doors. Uh, there are a lot of good things in this bill, and I'm very pleased with it. Was there anything that you really wanted in the bill that you didn't get or that you can try next year? Well, there, uh, it, I didn't get everything that I wanted. Uh, that's the way the process works here. Uh, I felt like the better venue for dealing with these issues was the Ethics Commission, and that's what I had proposed. Uh, it didn't turn out that way, and we will uh, give this a shot and see how it works. I'm trusting that the General Assembly will take these responsibilities very seriously. And they'll police uh, themselves in a way with the rules and regulations that give the public credibility that uh, they're working on their behalf. As you addressed the General Assembly last night, you said that uh, 19 out of 20 wasn't bad comparing it to a quarterback rating of uh, completion percentage. I assume the one you were talking about would be the Faith and Family right. Amendment. Um, are you going to try that again, or was, was there a different tactic that could be taken to get that passed? Well, we'll continue to work uh, one by one to persuade. You know this is a constitutional amendment. I feel very passionately about the Faith and Family Services Amendment. Uh, we will help people to understand what we want it to, uh, to do, and it's simply to enable our faith-based institutions to participate in the delivery of social services to our citizens. They're great partners. They've got great organizations, and they, are, they have a a heart of love and compassion to do that, we want to engage them in that effort. And uh, we'll continue to work one by one with the legislatures to, uh, uh, legislators to uh, persuade them to, uh, to give the people the right to vote. The people have the final say on this. It's a constitutional amendment. I'm trusting that uh, we uh, will get it done next year. We definitely will be back with a proposal. Now, Democrats tended to say that uh, they thought school vouchers were hidden somewhere in there and they wanted some assurances. Is there any way to tweak the legislation to, to get a few Democrats on board? You know, the sad thing about this is it turned into a partisan issue, and it's not partisan. Faith is not a partisan issue, and, uh, and the ability of faith-based institutions to help people is not partisan. I was very disappointed that our Democrats on the Senate side chose to make it a party-line vote and a partisan issue where it's not at all. I hope they'll uh, abuse themselves of that, uh, of that persuasion, understand what we want to do. We'll help them to know that our hearts are, are, are in the right way in trying to help this. doesn't have anything to do at all, none whatsoever, with school vouchers. Tort reform passed so early in the session, we tend to almost forget about it. Uh, I, I believe you're pleased at the outcome of that. Very pleased, Gerald. We were concerned about the ongoing access to health care, particularly for women, as our OBs and GYNs were leaving practice earlier uh, in their peak years because of uh, litigation threats and the liability of the concerns that they had. This, I believe, will go a long way to giving us access to health care to the future, stopping the junk, frivolous lawsuits that have been plaguing uh, that industry with higher costs, and I think still protect people's rights to have their day in court if they should need it. 
Your education initiatives also did well with the final one passing yesterday. Yes, we were very pleased with that. Uh, certainly our teacher tax cut with the $250 out of pocket uh, and the pay raise for teachers, but the virtual high school uh, access to online advanced science and math courses for our students wherever they live in the state uh, is very important. Our master teacher concept where we recognize and identify those teachers who have distinguished themselves as really star teachers and then allow them to become academic coaches who could mentor other young and or inexperienced teachers into following in their path and footsteps. I know you're a big booster of the state and a big proponent of tourism and economic development, and, uh, and you had some of those initiatives passed this year. We did. I'm very proud of our tourism initiative that will help to coalesce Georgia's efforts in tourism around the state. We, as you know, we've got some wonderful venues in a beautifully diverse state. It'll help us to use that in an economic development way. We had a great small business package in there for a tax cut for small businesses uh, that'll go a long way. The Entrepreneur Network, uh, many things that will help our economic development and job growth in Georgia, which is moving along quite nicely. I heard Speaker Richardson today uh, grade the session, and he said it would be somewhere in the A category. Do you concur with that? I think it was very productive. I don't know if we give a letter grade or a number grade, but I think it was productive. I think it was workmanlike. I think uh, the House and the House leadership came in, surprised everyone with their forthrightness, their workmanlike attitude, and the productivity. So I think uh, the House and the Senate did very well, and I'm very thankful and appreciative for the way they treated my legislation. As you said earlier, there's no quarterback. I'll take a 95% completion rate any day. Governor, thank you very much. Thank you, Gerald. And coming up later, the governor's reaction to the smoking ban and the voter bill that, that requires photo IDs. Governor Sonny Perdue has said he's very pleased that all three parts of his education agenda are headed back to his desk. The last bill, Senate Bill 35, cleared the House last night. And lawmakers Jesse Freeman now joins us more with, uh, with more on that bill. Jesse. Thank you, Wandy. Senate Bill 35 was by far the most controversial of the governor's three <coughs> education bills. It delays classroom size reduction for grades 4 through 12 for two more years. Also passing both chambers were the governor's virtual schools bill and the master teacher program. Senate Bill 33 creates the Georgia Virtual High School where students may take AP courses online. Senate Bill 34 creates the Master Teacher and Academic Coach programs which recognize superior teachers. Both bills had strong bipartisan support. Both of those bills I think look to the future of education. Uh, course 33, the Virtual High School bill is going to allow so many students, particularly in rural Georgia, have access to online courses. Uh, the master teacher, again, is another part. Uh, mentor and coaching uh, teachers, those uh, teachers who have uh, excelled and uh, uh, been known among their peers as those teachers who are the best of their class. We want to recognize them as master teachers. Senate Bill 35 delays class size reductions mandated by the Barnes administration for two more years. It sparked debate between the parties. If we don't have some flexibility with respect to class sizes, we're looking at, at a cost of, of an estimate of $200 million that will cost local school systems. It's a policy decision. It's a budget decision if you say we don't have enough money this year, therefore we can't do it. If you're saying two years, uh, you're not going to do it. I think that that means that for the entire length of time, with one year exception in the governor's term, we have postponed it. I think that's what he really wants to do. And Senator Dan Moody sponsored all three of those bills. He is chairman of the Senate Education Committee. Later on in the show, we'll tell you a little bit more about the Virtual High School Initiative and a young man who helped bring about the idea, so stick around. All right, Jesse, we'll be looking forward to that story. All Thanks right. so much. Meanwhile, Lieutenant Governor Mark Taylor says he would give this session a medium grade. I spoke with the Lieutenant Governor today, and he said he was proud of the benefits package passed by the legislature. I think the General Assembly uh, was really moved by the fact that over 4,000 Georgians are either in Iraq or Afghanistan or in route there. And I think more and more we're realizing uh, what an impact that is on their families that are left behind. So we're real proud of how the General Assembly stepped up and in a number of ways, including uh, our HEROES package uh, of uh, historic economic relief for our exceptional soldiers, uh, some uh, economic relief, some education benefits, and certainly dealing with that troubling life insurance situation where our soldiers are now have the opportunity to be covered by a $250,000 life insurance policy. 
uh, while they're on active duty. We're real proud of the General Assembly's uh, response uh, to the uh, worldwide war on terrorism and Georgia's part in that. One of the last bills passed last night was the ethics bill. Some call it ethics reform. Some were calling it less than that. What's your take on the final bill, the conference committee report that was passed? Well, I don't believe that uh, we've done uh, what we should have done on that issue. I'm very, very concerned about the concept of, of legislators uh, regulating legislators. I'm concerned about the fact that uh, open meetings and open records uh, will be an issue uh, around the investigation of ethics complaints against legislators. So that was a disappointment. I've always believed, I've always promoted uh, an independent ethics commission uh, fully funded uh, with an independent staff and the opportunity uh, to make independent decisions. I I'm worried about the idea of a legislative uh, ethics committee uh, to look at complaints against legislators. I don't think it works well in Washington. It's modeled after the Washington, D.C. approach, and, and I don't think it's going to work well here. Uh, certainly, I'm glad that parts of my ethics proposal uh, that I've been pushing uh, ever since I was elected lieutenant governor to require more disclosure from elected officials, more disclosure from their families. I was proud to see that as part of the package. Uh, disappointed that there is no gift band uh, because that's a problem here in, in Georgia state government. Uh, and uh, disappointed uh, in some of the approaches uh, that were taken or attempted to be taken to deal with conflicts of interest. We still have no lobbyist disclosure. Uh, fortunately, we did get a revolving uh, door provision which should prevent uh, some uh, elected officials from uh, switching over to lobbying the legislature uh, for some very, very lucrative contracts. So again, on ethics, I think it's very similar to the story of the session. Some good things, some disappointing things. One of the bills that ended up resonating more or causing as prolonged and emotional, passionate debate as I've seen in quite a while was what became known as the voter ID, the photo ID bill. One could argue on the face of it that a lot of people would say, well, you, you need a photo ID to cash a check. You need a photo ID for a lot of things in life. What's the big deal about a photo ID? But what we're hearing now that this is going to be an issue that is going to outlive the session. What is your take on what the intent of that legislation was and the uh, tremendous amount of passion that it stirred up during the last few weeks? Well, it's uh, a, an example of all that is wrong with politics today all that is wrong in the method that is being used to run Georgia. And that is it was a partisan and racially divisive piece of legislation, totally unnecessary. Sure, a, voter, uh, a, a photo ID uh, is a form of identification, and it can be used uh, uh, at, the, at the polling place. Uh, but there are also other nationally approved forms of identification. No one has stated the case that uh, misidentification of voters is a problem causing fraud uh, in Georgia. This was simply another one of those wedge issues that's being used to divide our state along partisan and racial lines. And when we have so many challenges in Georgia, 49th in education, 49th in SAT scores, an economy that's not where it needs to be in rural Georgia, in inner city Georgia, uh, kids being removed from health care coverage. Why would you spend so much time on what is obviously such a divisive issue? Uh, I was really disappointed uh, that the Republican leadership would continue to drive that issue uh, as their top, one of their top priorities of the session because it was simply so divisive. And uh, I believe that it was used as a way to cover uh, other parts of the bill that were very partisan in nature, uh, changing the date for electing judges, doing away with the general election uh, primary. A lot of things in that bill uh, were lost in the debate over how many forms of ID we would use. What we need to be doing in Georgia is getting more people involved in the process, encouraging more people to vote, and let our election officials state the case 
if they need if there needs to be uh, a tightening of the forms of identification used. If it's okay for the federal government, why isn't it okay for Georgia? So it's very disappointing, and I don't believe it will survive review by the Justice Department, and I do believe. Uh, that it will be an issue that uh, will continue to divide Georgia uh, going in uh, to the 2006 elections. And before we continue with our legislative coverage and update on the situation at the Capitol, as we told you earlier, the state Capitol uh, late this afternoon, early this evening, was evacuated because of a bomb threat. This is videotape shot just a few minutes ago as that evacuation was taking place and police began to go in the building and make a sweep. We understand they have uh, made a search of the Capitol or are in the process of making a search of the Capitol building. Again, a bomb threat. Uh, I don't know if it was phoned in, but a bomb threat made obvious sometime late this afternoon, early this evening. The Capitol evacuated. We'll give you more information as it becomes available. Meanwhile, this session, the General Assembly passed a bill that outlaws smoking in many public facilities. Senate Bill 90 now awaits Governor Purdue's signature. Lawmakers Chrissy Knight joins us with more on that story. Chris. Thanks, Gerald. Senate Bill 90 would ban smoking in many public facilities, including restaurants that serve to customers under the age of 18. Yesterday, the Senate agreed to the House's changes to the bill by a vote of 46 to 4. We've been working on this for four years now. Senator Don Thomas's bill that bans smoking in almost all public areas will soon be signed into law. It will eliminate uh, uh, smoking in uh, restaurants and uh, uh, places of business uh, as long as they don't allow anyone under 18 in or employ anyone under 18. So it's going to go a long ways in uh, eliminating smoking and uh, keeping our young folks from beginning the bad habit. Senate Bill 90 passed out of the Senate. The bill was later amended in the House. Representative Stacey Reese says the changes made to the bill in the House resulted in a stronger piece of legislation. We also added an amendment that would allow uh, private clubs to have smoking rooms as well as VFWs, uh, the American Foreign Legions, things of that nature as well. So we were very pleased that the House passed still what we believe is a very strong bill. We think it's a bill that George is going to be very happy with. Restaurant owner Senator Don Balfour agrees this new ban on smoking will make for a healthier Georgia. Uh, you know, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's an idea whose time has come. Many states have passed these smoking ordinances. I think in the future you'll see that all, almost all states will pass a smoking ban in restaurants. And later in the broadcast, we'll take a look at the progress of other business-related bills that made their way through this year's session. Thanks, Chris. And back on the smoking issue, will Governor Sonny Perdue sign the statewide smoking ban? I asked the governor that question today, and he said he hasn't made up his mind. I'm still undecided. I've got such great respect for Dr. Thomas and his passion as a physician, as a senator uh, for this issue. Uh, obviously, his passion, his concern, and the vote of the General Assembly will carry a lot of weight with me in that. Uh, frankly, I committed early in the year that I don't think government ought to be the nanny of all people and all things, and I feel very strongly about that. So I'm really torn about this issue and uh, haven't concluded how I'll vote uh, on it, but uh, I certainly want to give Dr. Thomas a congratulations for working on something that he believes in very passionately. We'll look and see if it makes common sense. Some of the exe exep exceptions and exemptions seem rather uh, counterintuitive, so we'll look at it and see, but uh, that's one I haven't decided on. House Speaker Glenn Richardson told reporters this morning that he takes pride in the smoking ban toward an abortion reform and land conservation legislation, but he's especially proud that the General Assembly completed its work in 39 days. It was a, largely symbolic. Uh, no one had ever done it before. I mean, the, the concept has always been that you take as much time as you're provided. Uh, I have a little saying, it takes as long to do something as the time within which you're permitted to do it. And uh, whether that's your homework, studying for a test, uh, cutting the grass, or anything else, people tend to take as long as they're permitted. And uh, it's refreshing every once in a while to study for the test early and get your homework done early and get the job done early and cut the grass a day early. And frankly, we took out a day early. After the press conference, I sat down with Speaker Richardson to get his impressions of his first session leading the House. He said there were some curveballs, but the tensions that arose didn't take him by surprise. We don't expect there to be smooth sailing. There's supposed to be contentious issues. Anytime you're adopting any kind of new law, there ought to be debate and there ought to be dissension, and then you ought to have a compromise and come up with a good solution. But I think uh, 
it was it's a lot different when you're standing up looking down than when you're sitting down looking up as to how the process goes uh, and it was just particularly difficult to manage the process and uh, every time I'd look out at the floor I think you know there's a 180 elected officials in one room together and we've all got to speak with one voice and uh, that's a challenge but uh, the house members did a great job following house rules and with minor exception we uh, held the rules and uh, preserved the decorum of the house. In terms of the culture of the house and, and, and having a Republican majority in the house as well as in the Senate and throughout the, uh, the General Assembly, what, what were some of the challenges and how did you overcome them in terms of getting people used to how the rules were going to go? Well, we had an education process, but uh, we had a lot of pre-planning. We didn't just come in here on day one, as you know, and uh, decide that we could uh, run this thing. We, we started way before the election. And it seems a little uh, competent of us, but, but we felt like we could win. And we started planning things, and uh, we put in place processes that helped us to uh, be ready. And then after the elections, when we won, we immediately started working on the rules. And we tried to write the rules in a uh, fashion where we could have orderly debate, not stifle issues uh, un unreasonably, and uh, run the House with 180 people. And I, I feel like we did a good job of that. And I know there's some complaints about the rules. Uh, there's always going to be complaints about the rules, especially those that don't like the result. That's what you do. If you don't like the result, you complain about the process. Now, having served in the House when the Republican Party was in the minority, what do you think that you brought, and certainly some of the other Republican leaders, to perhaps balance the process and allow the Democrats that, who are in the minority now to be a part of the process? Well, you have to always remember that... Uh, in all governance, the majority party is what's going to drive the train. And um, having served in the minority, um, I think it's probably better for us to transition from minority to majority than go from majority to minority. Uh, because uh, we know what it's like to be in the minority. And uh, there were times I would look out at, at the people in the minority party and I would say, I know what you're doing. I understand. I've been there. But the way we were able to do it is, uh, you know, I, I have a great leadership team. You know, uh, Speaker Rotem, Mark Burke, Alter, Majority Leader, Jerry King, Majority Whip, Barry Fleming, Sue Burmeister, Sharon Cooper, and I keep naming Earl Earhart, and uh, the list goes on. And we, we have a great group of successful business people, and uh, they were able to bring all those skills to the table for us. Talk a little bit about what makes you most proud, and if you look back on this session, kind of what would you like for people to remember and, and characterize it as? Uh, well, I think it'll be characterized and should be characterized as uh, perhaps one of the most uh, successful and sweeping legislative sessions in Georgia history at a time when there was all this transition. We passed civil justice reform, which I'm very proud of for the state, and we passed the woman's right to know. Uh, we passed congressional uh, redistricting and we passed a statewide smoking ban. We passed an ethics reform and we put in a new uh, conservation plan to preserve land in Georgia. And uh, we did about 50 other bills. And we didn't have an aggressive agenda because we knew we had to come in and first decide where the offices were going to be. And I, we did all of the legislation in amongst a, a, a massive changeover of state government and a transfer of power. And uh, I think that's what we'll be, we'll be remembered for. If we had done nothing else other than when I just left off the budgets, the budgets, the very aggressive budgets, we would um, have done our job. But we did much more than that, and I think Georgians should be proud. And I think they can look at this new Republican majority and say uh, they really do know how to govern. Well, some might uh, say that actually the time after Sine Die is, is an important time when everyone goes back to their districts and, and works. In terms of uh, what you'll need to do as, as the Speaker, what, what happens after the legislative session for you? I don't know. I've never done this before. Uh, we're, we're, uh, we're, this is the first day following the session, and I, I've got to get a handle on that. I have some interesting scheduling demands, people wanting me to travel and speak and show up at conferences. and. Uh, yet I have a, a job, even though the speaker's job is not really part-time, it's not considered full-time. And uh, I, so I have another life I live where I, I go work as a lawyer. And I, I hope to be able to juggle that with my family, my community, my church, 
and uh, my business. And uh, then I have to also run a, a campaign every two years to stay reelected with the people in my district. So uh, there, there's some juggling going on. I'm, I'm going to have to kind of feel my way through it and do the best I can. But uh, uh, I think I'll apply the same things that I've done in the past and get through it. And I hope to uh, get started on that in a few hours. <laughs> well, that sounds very good. Well, we certainly appreciate your time, Speaker Richardson. Thank, thank you. Thank you for having me. Have a good day. Several business-related bills made their way through the Georgia Dental Assembly this year. We mentioned earlier in the broadcast about Senate Bill 90, which bans smoking in many public facilities. Chris Knight returns with a recap of other bills that passed this session and their impact on business in the state. Chris. Thanks, Gerald. In addition to several pieces of legislation brought forth by senators and representatives, Se Governor Sonny Perdue introduced several business-related initiatives this session. Here's a look at some of these initiatives and the outcomes of the bills. The Slam Spam Email Act is one of Governor Purdue's initiatives that would fight against deceptive emails commonly referred to as spam. Sending spam to Georgians, this is how strong we feel about it, will be punishable as a felony under certain conditions where spammers send a high volume, more than 10,000 messages in a 24-hour time period, more than $1,000 in revenue from a single spam message, and more than $50,000 from all spam transmitted to a single ISP. Another one of Governor Purdue's business-related initiatives that passed this session includes a plan that aims to protect Georgians' cell phone numbers from unsolicited calls. The Wireless Privacy Act requires cell phone service providers to first obtain a consumer's consent before publishing that person's contact information in any directory. The legislation comes in light of the looming distribution of a nationwide wireless 411 directory of private cell phone numbers. That directory would put our private cell numbers out there for all the world to see including telemarketers, text message spammers, stalkers, and other unwanted callers. Also this session, Governor Purdue's initiative that protects Georgia's natural resources by encouraging conservation across the state will soon be signed into law. Governor Purdue says the Land Conservation Act is more far-reaching than any previous conservation efforts in Georgia. $100 million in state, federal, and private funds are committed to jumpstart the program. This act will stand as a commitment to our children and our grandchildren to preserve a statewide network of land and of water resources, prime agricultural and forestry lands, and natural, historic, and recreational areas for them to enjoy for their lifetime and their children's lifetime. And the governor's tourism initiative also passed this session. The new Georgia Tourism Foundation would create a public-private foundation to maximize and consolidate Georgia's marketing efforts. Tourism is the second largest industry in the state. We're going to let people know really what we have to show off here in Georgia. The foundation will be our means to centralize tourism marketing to increase the cost effectiveness of every tourism marketing and advertising dollar that we spend. Another business-related bill that heads to the governor's desk will give residents of Sandy Springs a chance to vote whether or not to incorporate as a city. This session, legislators passed House Bill 37, which provides for the ballot question that could create Georgia's seventh largest city. Also this session, a bill revising the Georgia minimum wage law passed the House and Senate. House Bill 59 would not give local governments the power to set living wage mandates. Representative Earl Earhart sponsored the bill. It does not allow local political subdivisions to go outside of the federal and the state minimum wage requirements. Or it doesn't, conversely, it doesn't allow them to place on a business a uh, partner benefit or some type of uh, insurance coverage that they would rather not. So it's a basic right that uh, businesses have not to be put in that position by their political subdivision. If a person doesn't make a living wage, it really costs the city. For example, if a person makes 5 or $6 an hour, they can't afford health insurance. So what does that mean? When they get sick, they go to Grady Hospital in Atlanta and Fulton and uh, DeKalb County, you know, pay for it. They can't afford uh, to pay their rent, so what? You have to provide public or affordable housing for them. So it is, in effect, a subsidizing of employers who pay less than the, wa than the living wage for the city or the other political jurisdictions. Other business-related bills that did not pass this session include a bill that would create a training wage of $4.25 for workers under the age of 20. Senate Bill 5 also died in committee earlier this session. That bill would increase the government's power of eminent domain. Thanks so much for that update, Chris.
Well, Democrats have clashed with Republicans on issues from education and health care to the environment. About an hour before the House was gaveled into session yesterday, I sat down with House Minority Leader DeBose Porter to get his assessment about this year's turn of events under the Gold Dome. Democrats have staked out the clear position for open government. We have sought to protect the Hope Scholarship. We have fought to do as much as we could to protect children's health care and support uh, property rights for individuals in existing uh, industries. We think that for families and for business, a more open government, a better educated Georgia, a healthier Georgia is better. And I think those lines have been clearly drawn this session. And now we can take it from this chamber and back to the people. And I think that will be our message. And I, and I almost thank the majority caucus for helping make this so clear. So many times we've kind of protected that, but now they have no excuses. I mean, when they come with a weak ethics bills, they can't blame anyone now, as they have. Uh, they can't blame former administrations on the budget anymore. Uh, so I think people will finally see what they have and hold them accountable, and uh, that makes us look forward to elections next year. Now, obviously, in addition to the uh, breaking down along party lines, there's been some breakdown along racial lines as well. I'm wondering, in terms of the potential uh, change in the voter ID legislation that's coming down the pipe, how will that impact? I want to make it clear. Yes, it, yes, it hurts minority community. But I want to remind people who argued against that on this floor. Jeanette Jameson, white female Democrat from North Georgia. Mickey Chanel, white rural Democrat male from Middle Georgia. Penny Houston, white Republican female from South Georgia. It affects rural areas and, age, and, and senior citizens as much as anyone else. So it's not just a minority issue. I mean, you don't have to take your mother down to the DMV lines just to get a picture ID to vote. Everyone tried to compare that to the privileges of membership, that for your membership you show a picture ID. We're talking about the rights of citizenship which is much different. Plus, we have never had a problem with voter ID fraud. Let's switch gears a little bit. Uh, you talked generally about the budget, but if we can look a little bit more specifically, not only about the budget, but some of the changes that have come down legislatively in terms of health care around the state. I'm wondering, how would you evaluate uh, what the legislature has done in terms of health care for the people of the state? Well, for, for state employees, I think they, when they realize what the uh, Republican leadership has done in their plan, they're going to be very upset. And I think with peach care, you're continuing the lockout uh, of children because a parent uh, may be late in the way they pay their premium. You're talking about people that make you know, $20,000 or less. Even with your phone bill, there's a way to pay something locally. And when everything is done on a mail-in, when you have people who are working who are trying to uh, make ends meet. Now, they need to pay the premium. I'm not saying that there not had to be some responsibility, but even your insurance company will send you a notice saying your insurance will be canceled and you read the fine print unless we receive this premium by a certain date. We're not even given that opportunity to our most vulnerable uh, with peach care. The governor has, has proposed a number of changes and those have made their way through the General Assembly. How do you think that those are going to impact education around the state? Well, basically all they've done is postpone the smaller class sizes for two years. You know, we understood the budget crunch two years ago and we were willing to extend that a year to year until the money was where we could implement that. But uh, this leadership has decided let's put that off for two years. Now, if we're just going to postpone improvements to education. We're having improvement in reading scores in third grade, and there's no question in my mind because of smaller classrooms, and that was put in during the Barnes administration. That was really begun with Zell Miller with the pre-K program. When you get children ready earlier, and then you have small classrooms in K through three where teachers can do the thing they love doing, which is get children and, and work with them, then we've seen positive results from that. And we're saying beyond the third grade, we're going to worry about that in a couple of years. Policy-wise, Democratic caucus just think that's wrong. We finally have a billion dollars in additional revenue, and we're saying that is not a priority, and we think that's wrong. Also, the attack on the Hope Scholarship. The Hope Scholarship Fund is not in jeopardy, but here they sought to, to restrict the eligibility of, of certain degrees, 
that have always been there since the inception pope. I just don't understand this attack on the Hope Scholarship when it's been the most successful job training program, much less for higher education. Look at the bright Georgians that we've kept in Georgia because of the Hope Scholarship. And why we would put barriers to that is beyond understanding to me. But this leadership has sought to do that. That passed the House. Thank goodness it was held in the Senate, but it could certainly happen next year. But this Democratic caucus is against uh, anything to restrict the Hope Scholarship and opportunity to education for those people who earn it. It's not a giveaway program. You have to work a little harder to keep a B average. What would you like to see House Democrats doing, doing during the off season to get ready for the next legislative session? Uh, define our message. Define what has really happened this session now that this, this majority has taken over and what they have done. They had a great opportunity. Look at the rules and the Hawk system. You now, people don't really tie into process things or things that happened on the Gold Dome, but they know the Hawk system's wrong. They understand stacking the deck, they understand cheating at cards. <laughs> And I think they realized that the rules implemented to begin the session were wrong, that the priorities are wrong, and to end the session with the budget with the priorities set out on what we fund and do not fund uh, is a strong message for, we, uh, for us to take back to the people and start making a distinction between Georgia Democrats and Georgia Republicans. And now we continue our recap of some of the major legislation of the session with a look at some of the social issues that have been debated. Lawmakers Jesse Freeman returns with more on that legislation. Jesse. Thank you, Gerald. Uh, much of the legislation dealing with social issues this session centered around divorce and how it might affect children. Georgia will get an overhaul in the way child support orders are rendered, but a bill delaying divorces for couples with children did not make it through. The General Assembly passed new laws that would lengthen the process of getting an abortion. Representative Sue Burmeister sponsored HB 197. A woman has to take a 24-hour pause in her decision. Uh, we put a lot of pieces in there to protect that and um, some things that will be put into law, uh, materials that they're given so they can read all the alternatives to abortion. Representative Sue Burmeister also sponsors HB 221, which changes how child support orders will be calculated in divorce proceedings. Both chambers have agreed to the bill. We are now getting back to where the majority of the states in this nation look at, when they look at child support, they don't just look at the non-custodial income. They now have to look, since this bill passed, and we'll go to the um, governor for signature, we'll look at both parents' income when determining child support. And hopefully we will have a fair system that will be fair to all of the, uh, both the custodial and non-custodial parents, but most important of all, it encourage ch children to have both parents involved in their career. A bill that would require longer ways to get a divorce failed to come out of the House. Senator Mitch Seaball authored SB 25. What Senate Bill 25 would do is that it would extend the waiting period for a couple that want to get a divorce, if they have children, to extend that waiting period to 120 days before they could complete the, the, the divorce. Also, it would require them to attend three hours of counseling of the effects of divorce on the couple and on the children. The Senate failed to give a two-thirds majority to the governor's Faith and Family Services Amendment to the state constitution. It would have allowed faith groups to receive state money. I think people just need to go home and realize that uh, they're hurting the state and they're hurting an awful lot of really uh, wonderful agencies by having the problem, having the, those uh, Blaine amendments or Mercer amendments, whatever you want to call it. Uh, whatever they call it, but the, the bottom line is that is they are harmful to uh, so many of our social service agencies that are religious based and uh, those folks do an awful lot of good work and we need to help them all we can. And both chambers agreed to HB 669 which will allow the PSC to make documents available to visually impaired people. I um, worked very hard all session on a bipartisan bill that would uh, provide um, access to information services for visually impaired people. And it was one of the last bills to pass tonight. Uh, it was a great accomplishment, a bipartisan bill that we can all be proud of, and one that will really uh, help Georgians uh, who are visually impaired realize their fullest potential. Now, Seth Harp, who is the sponsor of the Governor's Faith and Family Service Amendment, vows to fight on next year with the resolution. It failed to receive the necessary two-thirds majority to pass the Senate on two occasions. All right. Thanks so much, Jesse.
Well, now an update on a story we've been keeping you apprised of this evening. The house, uh, the Capitol, rather, was evacuated earlier this evening based on a bomb threat. Now that officials have swept the Capitol, they have given it an all clear. It appears that there was no bomb within the Capitol. And in other news, the House bill requiring photo ID at the polls was agreed to by both houses yesterday. The House agreed to the conference committee report in the afternoon, and the Senate agreed late last night. That measure has sparked emotional debate this session, and yesterday was no different. Here's some of that debate from the Senate floor. We have a photo ID bill. Negative symbols. Negative policy. 17 pieces of identification that heretofore were acceptable, we reduced them by a dozen. You have to ask yourself the question, am I going to be that person tonight that reaches out and offers a hand to someone who's in pain, or am I going to stand with the bully? I'll say this to the people who were here last week and the people all over this state who are angered by what is being done tonight. Don't get angry. Get smart. Stand up and fight. The time has come. You're destroying the rights of people to vote. And you're, if you destroy one, one, one individual's vote, one old lady from my district whose husband was a veteran, you're wrong. Again, the conference committee report to House Bill 244 was adopted by both chambers and now goes to the governor. And Governor Sonny Perdue supports the voter ID legislation. He says it will not only help deter voter fraud, but will be of assistance in other ways. Well, I think voting is a very precious uh, privilege and a right, but, and we ought to preserve the integrity of that process. Our democratic republic and our democracy pillars really depend on the integrity of the voting process. I would that every person eligible in the state would go to the polls and vote. The fact is they don't. But those who do go, uh, I believe, need to have proper identification. You can't, uh, at a certain age, you can't get in a movie, can't buy an alcoholic beverage, can't get on an airliner, and uh, if you want to go buy a gun, you can't even buy a gun without a photo ID. Unfortunately, in this society in which we live today, a picture ID is becoming necessary for life. My goal is to be proactive in this effort and help those few people who do not have uh, photo IDs to get them easily, cheaply, and conveniently. I think that's a better service that we can do. They're only going to use it to vote once every couple of years, maybe, but they may use it in their lives, uh, cashing checks and other things on an ongoing basis, and that's our goal, to use this to help them get that picture ID. From tort reform to the Criminal Justice Act of 2005, legal matters were a major part of the 2005 session. David Zelsky returns with more on these law matters that were uh, discussed during this session. David. Well, thanks, and Wandi. The legislature also voted to change some laws to fight the growing problem of methamphetamine production in Georgia. And Republican leadership decided to change congressional maps, which may help them with their numbers in Washington. But first, the first major issue is the general, that the General Assembly tackled this year was tort reform. When some women in the rural areas already have to drive 50 or more miles... Tort reform talks dominated much of the first half of the session, especially for Senate Bill 3 sponsor Preston Smith. To ensure affordable access to quality health care and create a more positive business environment in Georgia for job creation and growth. Opponents of the bill felt putting a cap on non-economic damages and medical malpractice suits was like putting a cap on the value of human life. ER immunity is not the right thing. Creating accountability-free zones in Georgia emergency rooms is not the right thing. And placing an arbitrary price tag on people's lives, their love, and their limbs is not the right thing. Senate Bill 3 passed both houses and was signed just one week later by Governor Perdue. Senate Bill 3 is now law in Georgia. Yeah. Sudafed and eight other types of cold medicine containing pseudoephedrine may soon be behind the counter. Pseudoephedrine is the key ingredient in manufacturing the illegal drug methamphetamine. This epidemic is pervasive throughout this entire state and it won't be long if we don't do something before every single Georgia family has been touched, just like many of ours. Senator, it's a great point. Thank you. You're right. In fact, in some areas in rural Georgia and mine, it is estimated that one of every fifth house 
has some relation to the meth problem. There were several versions that made it to committees, some which would have put these nine cold medicines behind the pharmacy counter where a signature and photo ID would be needed for purchase, but those did not make it out of committee. We can't stop the rest of the world, but this is the most effective manner. House Bill 216, the version that did pass, also creates a retail awareness program where meth watch signs will be placed on all over-the-counter products used in cooking meth in home labs. If someone comes into a store and they buy six or eight products and every one of them are meth watch products, that clerk could fill out a suspicious activity report and fax it to local law enforcement. The local law enforcement will forward that to the GBI and the GBI has said that with Meth Watch they will track suspicious activity reports. House Bill 216 awaits the governor's signature. Recognizing the victim's rights. Another bill on the governor's desk is House Bill 170, known as the Criminal Justice Act of 2005. It makes some much needed uh, revisions to our criminal procedure laws, uh, the most significant of which is to give the equal number of strikes to the prosecutors as we do to the defense attorneys uh, in our criminal justice system. The governor believes in fundamental fairness everywhere, and that includes the courtroom. Representative Golick says the governor intends to sign House Bill 170, which would then go into effect on July 1st of this year. We have to give prosecutors the tools they need to do their jobs, and we believe in giving them the equal number of tools that we give the defense. The congressional district you live in may be changing by the next election. We attempted to make the districts much more compact. And I believe that, uh, I hope that the sight test and looking at what is on this side compared to what is on this side, uh, one can readily see that uh, if I was a citizen of the state of Georgia, I would have a much better opportunity to understand in what congressional district I live under this map as opposed to this map. I just don't understand why we need to go through this process this time, especially since we are so close to the next reapportionment and redistricting that will occur after the next census. Uh, it just doesn't make any practical sense, but as we look around here today, we see that the Republicans are doing a lot of things that don't make any practical sense. The House and Senate Republicans were successful in passing House Bill 499, which they believe will make it easier for Georgians to realize what district they live in. Four years ago, the uh, former majority party with the full compliance of the former governor um, introduced and passed legislative and congressional maps that were extremely partisan and gerrymandered. They didn't hide the fact, they bragged about it. After a long federal court trial, three, three court judge unanimously threw out the legislative maps as violating the constitutional principle of one person, one vote. While they did not throw out the congressional map, they did make several comments about its bizarre nature. House Bill 499 also awaits the signature of Governor Perdue. Now, as you saw, Judiciary Committees from both chambers stayed quite busy this year. Tort reform is already law, and the rest of the bills I mentioned await Governor Perdue's signature. All right, thanks so much for that update, David. One of Governor Purdue's education bills that passed early in the session will create the Georgia Virtual High School. The online program will provide advanced placement and other college prep classes to students around the state. One young man who did not have access to these courses at his school was a motivator for the bill. Lawmakers Jesse Freeman has more. Before Cliff Tippins came to the University of Georgia to study ag education, he was a senior at Clinch County High School. He wanted to take AP courses, but without a critical mass of students, he couldn't. That led to a conversation with Governor Sonny Perdue. He had a listening session where he invited students from the schools and also school administrators and parents and anyone involved in education to come and share their opinions. And I was fortunate enough to be selected by my school to represent Clinch County. And I, I stood up and informed the governor of my situation and that we had no AP classes. And I simply asked him a question, is it fair for rural students to be able to go to school and get an education and be left wanting AP classes? I admitted to him I didn't think it was fair. And uh, we set about trying to uh, make it fair. And I think that's what the virtual high school bill does. Cliff became involved with the legislative process and attended the State of the State Address and spoke for the bill at a Senate Education Committee meeting. I believe that through this bill, that the AP classes will be offered to students across the state. It will not only strengthen our schools, but strengthen our state as a whole. The bill eventually passed both houses with bipartisan support, and now students will have better access to AP courses online. I think Cliff is a type of bright young Georgian uh, that has his eyes open, his mind set, 
and knows where he wants to go. Now, the virtual high school legislation won't technically become law until the governor signs the bill. That ceremony will probably take place late next week. That's when the measure will be added to these official code books, and Cliff Tippins will make his mark on state law. Our government is, is for the people, by the people. And my participation in this and being able to know that my opinion was heard and, and did make a difference just reaffirms that for the people, by the people. Cliff says his experience has led him to believe that one person indeed can make a difference. Reporting from Athens, I'm Jesse Freeman for Lawmakers. Well, every year, Georgia Public Broadcasting covers the General Assembly, and our staff depends on the help of our interns. Seven future kingpins of the media industry have been perfecting their skills right here in our studios. David Zelsky tells the story of the magnificent seven interns of 2005. The coveted lawmaker's internship is not just about getting coffee. Dumkoff! Machinel! It's about making Xerox copies, and a whole lot more. Each intern plays a vital role in creating live television, finding skills within themselves that they never thought were possible, like making Xerox copies and more. This year's group comes to us from states far, far away, like Angela Vondrasik from Wisconsin, home of cheese. There's Yasmin Neal from Clayton College and State University, which is far away if you travel by foot. Marcus Howard is from Macon, Georgia, but discovered his love for politics while attending Boston College. Sean Yancey hails from Roswell, Georgia, and attended Atlanta's own Georgia State University. Sean is no longer on coffee duty. Then there's the versatile Jose Avila Kelly from the University of West Georgia. Jose traveled east and found work with us here at Lawmakers. Ashley Poland, regardless of her last name, is actually from Washington, D.C., but knew that the combination of a lawmaker's internship and a Georgia education would open her doors to success. Michael Riddle is another UGA grad whose lawmaker's internship has convinced him to go to law school so he can soon make more money than our entire staff. And that's the lawmaker's interns for 2005. I'm David Zelsky for Lawmakers. You know, Wendy, this was our 35th season on the air, and uh, even 35 years ago, I would have been too old to be an intern on the <laughs> show. <laughs> we do indeed depend on the fine young Absolutely. college students and graduates who help us out. This year has been another great crop of interns, and their help is invaluable. We couldn't do the show without them, nor could we do the program without the help of our excellent professional staff. Ladies and gentlemen, you are simply the best. Absolutely. And, you know, before we uh, end this broadcast, we should update folks on some of the transportation legislation that made its way through the General Assembly. Um, last night, the Senate agreed to the House changes to the bill that would change the way that the uh, federal transportation dollars come down. And although that bill has had a little bit of trouble uh, with people comprehending it exactly, it will actually equalize that funding formula. So that was able to uh, make it through the General Assembly. And speaking of the General Assembly, they are out for about nine months. We will be back uh, around the second week in January to do this all over again. Sounds good to me. Well, it's been a pleasure working with you again this session, General. Same here and wanted to do the best. All right, let's try to do it again next year. That's going to be our final broadcast covering the 2005 session of the Georgia General Assembly. Thanks for joining us. I'm Wandy Lawson. And I'm Gerald Bryan. For everyone here at Lawmakers, good night. Have a great spring and a great summer <laughs> and a great winter. We'll see you in January. <laughs> good night. This has been a production of Georgia Public Broadcasting.